Yoshito Kazashi, who is now in Heidelberg with uh, Shaikin recently, um, and it's about density estimation uh, um, in high dimension where we use the uh, uh, reducing the framework. Uh, and uh, we work at the important spaces, uh, which you by now know very well. So <laughs> it's, it's great that this uh, comes up uh, and one of the things <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the outline that will uh, set the problem of the density estimation. Um, and then uh, I will first give uh, a general analysis uh, in uh, RKHS spaces. Um, and the last part will be the uh, specific uh, application to weighted corridor spaces. Um, and I should uh, make here a couple of uh, disclaimers. Uh, so first, uh, um, I am uh, uh, not really an expert in uh, uh, density, kernel density estimation. So I hope we have not missed important uh, parts of literature and uh, you will not uh, tell me that all what, what I'm presenting here is very well known. <laughs> well, but if, it, if this is the case, please tell me. Uh, and um, the second uh, uh, disclaimer is that uh, why we use the Corbo spaces here uh, at the beginning was not uh, really motivated by application. It was more an academic exercise because we did uh, a, a work on uh, function approximation in uh, weighted Corbo spaces uh, by kernel methods. And then somehow we wanted to reuse these results for density estimation. But then we start thinking what could be good applications. I will comment on possible applications uh, uh, somehow when I get to the point three. Um, but this somehow is still an open um, I mean, topic for discussion. Okay, um, okay so uh, problem of density estimation, uh, uh, really uh, classical. So uh, suppose I have um, a, a random variable uh, from a probability space so omega fp to some measure space d. Uh, with some sigma algebra and, and, uh, and measure mu, not necessarily probability measure. Uh, and I'm interested in describing the law of this uh, random variable y. And I assume here that this law has a density with respect to this reference measure mu. So I can uh, write the probability of any event y being in any measurable set b as the integral of the density uh, in, in this set b. Uh, and what I want to estimate is f given a random sample. So given IID uh, realizations of this random variable y. So this is the only information that I have. And from this, I want to reconstruct the density f. Um, <clears throat> and so this is uh, set in uh, abstract uh, terms, but uh, in, this, in the last part of the talk, I will focus on the case, which uh, similar to what has been discussed this morning. Uh, so where D is a unit, uh, uh, hypercube 0, 1 to the d, and the d, d, d dimension d is potentially very large. So I'm interested in high dimensional density. Uh, and uh, I'm interested uh, actually in uh, results that are uh, free, uh, course of dimension free. So uh, is it possible to approximate this density in very high dimension without the course of dimension? Um, so, as I said, uh, I have, as I anticipated, the framework is the one of kernel approximation. So, I will work in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space NK, uh, which is defined by a kernel uh, on D. Um, I make those two assumptions on the kernel, in particular that the diagonal of the kernel is integrable with respect to the measure mu, which guarantees that uh, the reproducing kernel is contained in the L2 space. Um, and um, well, okay, that's classical. I mean, assume a minimum of regularity on the measure space so that the kernel and on the kernel itself so that the kernel has a series expansion that is uh, 
pointwise convergent on uh, orthonormal basis in L2 with uh, decaying coefficients detailed that go asymptotically to zero. But this is fulfilled in many cases. Uh, uh, I don't really need to know the series expansion for constructive method for the method, you just need to know the expression of the curve. Uh, but with this series function, you can uh, characterize the inner product in the reproducing kernel Lindbergh space by just uh, reweighting the Fourier coefficients in the expansion of, of the basis with uh, this beta L to the minus one. Uh, okay, so how do I approximate the density by a linear combination of the kernels? And this is the first uh, point uh, I'm making. So uh, the type of approximation will be linear combination of the kernel placed uh, in suitably chosen point uh, xj, which do not necessarily coincide with the sampling points. So uh, what I have, uh, the data are these points y1, ym, um, what is mostly done in kernel density estimation is to use these points for to place the kernels, but I don't want to do this for the reasons that I will explain in a minute. Uh, so I rather place the kernels in a well-chosen set of points, which will turn out to be a, a lattice rule, rank one lattice rule in the third part of the talk. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, I uh, take a linear combination with coefficient cj, which have to be chosen properly, and I will define in a minute how I will choose these coefficients. So, as a matter of fact, this approximation I've had will live uh, in a finite dimensional uh, subspace, uh, which I call Vn, which is given by the span of these kernels in the point xj. And, of course, xj has to be chosen properly so that this subspace has good approximation properly. Um, okay, here is the idea, and this is not our idea, it's actually uh, an idea that was proposed by Marcus Egland uh, and uh, co works in 2000 um, on how to approximate the density, and Michael Gribel has also worked on, uh, on, on this uh, approach. Um, the only difference with what, so in this paper by Marcus Egland, they were using finite elements as approximation uh, space, whereas here uh, I will use this uh, uh, span of, of, of the kernels. Uh, and the idea here, and uh, this has been also generalized to higher dimensions in this paper by uh, Perstorfer, um, Flug, and Burgartz, uh, where we, they used sparse finite elements in a dimension. Um, so the idea here is to start with an idealized uh, regression problem, where I just minimize the distance between the density F and my approximation V in L2 uh, with respect to the reference measure mu, and I penalize the RKHS norm of V. Um, now, as I said, if you just do standard kernel approximation, you would uh, look for the minimizer in the whole uh, RKHS space, but here I'm restricting to this uh, finite dimensional subspace Vn. Now, this is not really uh, viable because uh, if you solve this problem, you need F, you need to know F everywhere, which we don't. So we have to work a little bit more. So the idea is to expand the square here in the square of V, the square of F and the inner product. The square of F, you can just drop it because it doesn't depend on the minimizer V. So you're left with these three terms. And now the last step uh, is to do a Monte Carlo approximation of this uh, inner product. So this inner product is the integral of V against the density F, uh, but of what you know of F are only just few realizations of the random variable. So I approximate this integral by Monte Carlo, and this gives uh, this uh, expression here, okay? And this will be my computable uh, problem where F doesn't appear anymore, but what appears here are the realizations of the points that I have, YM. And this is a quadratic uh, uh, minimization problem to, to solve. And this was actually the problem proposed in, in, in these papers mentioned here. Um, so uh, written like this, I know that probably some of you are already ready to, to ask the, the question, but uh, um, so what is nice of this formulation here is that this is a quadratic minimization problem. 
so we can write uh, first variations and what we have to solve is a linear system. So we look for the coefficient CJ in this linear combination that satisfy this uh, uh, finite dimensional problem. Uh, and the matrix here will be the matrix. Uh, so the penalization term here is just the kernel. The, the matrix that correspond to this penalization term is just the kernel evaluated in Xi, Xj. And the matrix uh, that comes from this L2 inner product, you will have to take the inner product of the kernel centered in Xi, Xj, the L2 inner product. Uh, okay, so, um, Ah, and this is an important uh, uh, remark. If you look at this, uh, so this is the formulation of the problem for the density f hat. If we look at the expectation of this uh, estimator with respect to all possible random samples. So in expectation, this term here is uh, exactly what we started with is this inner product of f times of v, v times f. So on expectation, this problem here gives actually this uh, idealized estimator f hat star, the one that minimizes this L2, this uh, continuous L2 uh, misfit, okay? Um, so the expectation of this, uh, of my estimator f hat is this uh, f hat star idealized estimator. Um, okay goods and bads of this uh, procedure. Well, the good is that uh, is uh, simple. It's uh, just a quadratic uh, optimization. So it's very easy to, to put in place. Uh, you have to solve this linear system. Now the question is how easy or how difficult it is to compute this uh, matrix here and to solve this linear system. And uh, in the last part where I will apply to Corabo spaces and lattice rules, as a matter of fact, this matrix will be a circular matrix. So this system is solved easily with FFT. Uh, what is the bad? Well, the bad is that uh, um, in the formulation that I've given you, I'm not enforcing uh, a positivity of the density, nor I am enforcing that the density integrates to one. Okay. So, Okay, I'm giving up something in this formulation. Uh, so what I'm obtaining is uh, a signed measure and uh, uh, you, you could correct, correct us the process. process. So <laughs> by uh, over rates and you say on the Okay. Uh, so last, one last comment on this formulation of the problem. As I said, what would be more common in kernel density estimation is to minimize in the whole uh, reproducing, or at least if you do regression and not density estimation, uh, if you do uh, kernel ridge regression, you would minimize on the whole reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and then you exploit the representation theorem to conclude that your approximation is indeed a linear combination of kernels placed in the data points, okay? Um, however, in this uh, uh, formulation here, um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the sense that I could set up a minimization in the whole reproducing kernel Hilbert space, uh, but uh, the optimum, the, the minimizer is not actually in the span of the kernel placed in the data points. Okay, so you don't have this representation theorem here. And the reason is that you have this continuous L2 norm. I mean, from this term, yes, you would have a representation theorem, but for this part, it doesn't work. Uh, you can still say that uh, the minimizer in in a finite dimensional space and is actually a linear combination with e even equal weight one over M, or, but of a modified kernel, A star. And this modified kernel is easy to characterize in terms of series expansion. So it's just the original kernel, but you have to reweight here because of the penalization you will have here weights uh, beta L or beta L plus lambda. Uh, so uh, then, then the, and, and this kernel actually defines the same reproducing kernel Hilbert space because the decay, the asymptotic decay is the same of, of the beta L uh, ones. Um, so, but, but the only, the problem is that in general, you don't have this in closet form. Okay, so yes, you could use this uh, expression, but then you have to form the series and, and compute if you want to evaluate the density in any other point. 
uh, you will have to somehow approximate this infinite series and so on. Okay, so this is why we prefer to uh, uh, not go this way and just to project on this uh, predefined set of points. And then we know exactly what the kernel is and we work with the explicit expression of the kernel. Okay, so uh, uh, what can we say about the quality of, uh, of this reconstruction of the density? So the one that solved this, uh, this, this problem here. Uh, so we, uh, okay, the idea is to look at the mean integrated square error. So the error in uh, L2 between the true density and our estimator. Of course, our estimator is random because we're starting with a random sample. So we look in expectation with respect to all possible uh, random samples. Uh, and then this uh, mean square error naturally splits into two components, a bias square and the variance. So the bias will be, the L2 distance between the F and the mean of F hat, which is this F hat star, this idealized uh, estimator that uses the whole density F as information. Uh, and then the variance will be the, the other part. So the difference between F, F hat and the mean of F hat in L2 and in expectation. Uh, so the way we analyze this, and this is where maybe <laughs> these results are, are, are known, and I ask you for, uh, to, to, to tell me. Uh, so I did some uh, similar works uh, on regression. This was done with some colleagues in, in statistics uh, in, uh, in Polytechnic of Milan, uh, where they were looking at uh, reconstruction of a function, uh, unknown function f from point evaluations, noisy point evaluations. Uh, and they proposed to do this um, simple regression problem, but penalizing here uh, something. And what they wanted to penalize uh, is uh, the L2 uh, residual, um, the residual measured in L2 of some second order linear elliptic uh, uh, differential operator. So the, with the idea that somehow you have some knowledge on where this function f could come from, from, from some physical problems that solve uh, some PD, and then you want to embed this information into this uh, reconstruction or re regression problem. Okay. Uh, so I did a this work uh, analyzing this, uh, uh, the approximation in this, in this context, which could be phrased uh, in terms of reproducing kernel Hilbert space. You just look at the RKHS that is induced by L star L. Uh, as a kernel. And uh, um, so here we uh, essentially, we followed similar ideas that were proposed in this paper, but in more uh, abstract on general setting in reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Uh, and uh, actually for the analysis, I have to introduce a continuum scale of uh, Hilbert spaces, which I call NK tau. Tau is any parameter greater or equal than zero where uh, the, those are essentially functions in L2, which has some weighted norm, uh, uh, so some bounded norm, k tau. And this uh, norm here is defined as the sum of the Fourier coefficients of V weighted by beta L to the minus tau. So if you take tau equal one, you get uh, the original reproducing kernel Hilbert space. If you take tau equal zero, you get the L2, and this uh, defines uh, anything in between. Uh, and, uh, and then I can uh, define also the negative uh, n to the minus tau as the dual of, uh, of the nk tau space, and I can also end up with a proper norm. Uh, so if now I will try to analyze the bias and the uh, variance separately. So for the bias, so again, this error between the true density and the mean of the estimator. Uh, what we can, we would could show, what we could show is this result here. Um, that uh, so this bias essentially is due to two uh, different uh, components. One is the regularization, the penalization that we are putting. Of course, uh, if we fix uh, for a fixed penalization, we will never be able to recover the true uh, f unless lambda goes to zero asymptotically. Um, so one term is uh, due to the penalization, and the other is due to the fact that you are, we are projecting on this finite element, uh, finite dimensional space. So we will have uh, a projection error um, 
between the true F and the projection on the subspace Vn. And uh, since we are in uh, RKHS framework, the uh, projection with respect to the uh, RKHS uh, inner product is indeed the kernel interpolant. Okay, so the uh, IN here is the interpolant operator that finds for a given V uh, returns the element in the subspace uh, that uh, interpolates the V in the, in the points at stake. Uh, so this is one estimate of the bias and one can actually improve this estimate. And, and I mean, th this type of analysis are, are known for spl spline regression. Uh, um, and uh, so you can actually improve the, uh, lamp the penalization term here if you have extra smooth smoothness. So the first result assumes that F is in the reproducing kernel liberal space. But if F is in the NK square, uh, then uh, you get a lambda. You can get a lambda square out of here, uh, out of this term here, which of course improves it because it, I mean eventually lambda has to go to zero. But this says that lambda, the, this term of the bias will go to zero much faster than, than the other case. Uh, so uh, in, concerning the variance, uh, uh, again you want to compare the true estimator with its mean. So the difference between the two satisfies this uh, uh, problem. So remember the F hat uh, has a right hand side this empirical mean, whereas the F hat star, the true mean has uh, as a right hand side the inner product between F and V. So I rewrite this right hand side a little bit informally as the duality pairing between V and the difference between F and the empirical measure. Uh, placed in the data points by M. Uh, and then the idea to us to analyze this bias, uh, this variance term I can take as a test function F minus, uh, I mean the, this term here, F hat minus F hat star. And then I will have to measure somehow how, how fast this uh, goes to zero when M go to infinity and in what sense, in what uh, norm. So the result that uh, uh, we have is this one. So uh, again, on expectation, the L2 norm square plus the RKHS norm square weighted by lambda decay at the Monte Carlo rate one over M, uh, but with an extra one over lambda factor that, uh, that you have here. This is an easy uh, estimate. I mean, it's uh, uh, again, if you want to show this one is uh, quite easy. Uh, you just take the duality pairing here, you measure V in the RKHS norm, and you measure this uh, in the negative uh, norm. And you know that you can do this because the point evaluation is continuous uh, in the RKHS space. Um, now you want to absorb this term with the penalization term, but here you have a lambda in front. So then you have to pull out a lambda. So I use Young. So I have lambda square here and one over lambda on the other term. Um, so now this can be absorbed with, with a left. And then this one, if you expand the square and you take uh, expectation uh, because of independence, uh, essentially this gives the one over M Monte Carlo rate. Uh, so this is a, a quite easy estimate of the variance, but it's not optimal. And actually one can improve this estimate uh, if you somehow know that uh, these uh, functionals here are also continuous on some larger uh, space than just your original RKHS. Okay, so think of it that your RKHS is like a, a H2 in uh, two or three dimensions. Now the point evaluation is actually continuous also on a slightly bigger space. And then you can exploit this extra regularity of the point evaluation to get a better scaling in terms of lambda. Um, so if, uh, uh, it turns out that the point evaluation is actually continuous also on some nk tau with some tau smaller than one. So it's in the dual of nk minus tau. Uh, then you can improve this uh, estimate and having here a lambda to the power tau. Okay. So again, if your RKHS is very smooth, then you can take tau very, clo very close to zero and then you can almost kill this term lambda to the tau. Okay, so that's the idea. So if we put everything together, 
we have this type of uh, uh, estimates for uh, the mean integrated square error, so which can be bounded by three terms, the uh, interpolation error on the subspace, the bias term that scales either with lambda or lambda square, depending whether F is in the RKHS or in the RKHS square, and the variance term, which is one over M lambda to the power tau, where tau somehow depends on the smoothness of the RKHS. Uh, and the constants here, uh, they, they are quite explicit, uh, and the, the dimension never uh, does not appear in this, uh, uh, in this bounds here. It never appears in this bound. So this is very general. Uh, uh, there, there are some further assumptions like uh, this assumption here on the kernel on, on the density that you have to fulfill to, to get this bound. Um, okay, so then we wanted to use this, uh, this bound to, uh, I didn't pay attention all the time when I started. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I should not hurry too much. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, then the idea was to uh, apply these results on uh, the weighted Korobov spaces. Uh, so um, the setting is exactly the one that you have seen in the previous talks of, of this morning, uh, with the only exception that uh, I realized they've changed the notation uh, for, to be somehow more aligned to the PD world, where uh, let's say H beta beta would represent the Sobolev uh, regularity of the field, so the number of derivatives that you consider. For, so for the uh, QMC and uh, the IBC people, beta is to is alpha over two. You want to connect with the, with the previous talks. Uh, uh, so the definition uh, is, is exactly the same. Uh, so I have the, this, what, what is written here is the R alpha gamma function that you saw in the previous talks. I just put explicitly in the definition of the norm. So essentially those are uh, spaces of periodic uh, functions uh, on the, on the torus, the dimensional torus uh, with uh, uh, Sobolev uh, regularity um, where, and you can define the norm in terms of the Fourier coefficients weighted by each, uh, the frequency in each the direction x h j to the power two beta. So again, beta will be essentially the Sobolev regularity of the, of the functions. Uh, and then you plug weights, one over gamma, uh, weights uh, that somehow encode uh, how uh, big or how small are these uh, uh, derivatives. Um, so essentially the, the weights here penalize uh, when you take many derivatives uh, uh, at the same time, many beta derivatives at the same time. Um, okay. Uh, and of course, weights are essential if you want to obtain uh, uh, results that are dimension uh, in independent. Um, so uh, let me go a little. Um, uh, detour on, uh, uh, as I said, we, we started just because we wanted to use some other results from uh, weighted Cordova spaces, uh, but then we started thinking of what could be the, so some applications that could fit in this framework. And uh, I only have a partial answer to this, uh, but I think it's an interesting uh, uh, direction for, for, for research and open uh, uh, I mean, it raises uh, questions. Uh, so the first is uh, why periodic? Now here we are in the case of density estimation and not function estimation. Uh, and actually for density estimation, the thing might look better for periodic data because there are quite uh, some number of phenomena that uh, could be interpreted as periodic. Uh, and period could be either in time or in space, so time periodic data could be data over, for instance, a day. So you want to look at the distribution of some quantity over the day. Okay, like uh, an example here is the distribution of, of crime. So the probability that some crime happen at which hour of the day, okay? 
Um, now, okay, you could look at a single location in the single, single city and uh, just uh, take integrated data and, and do the histogram of the number of crimes that happen at each time, time of the day. But then you might look at multiple locations and look at correlations between locations or different cities or different places in the cities. And then you could go to the extreme and look at a random field, so a continuum uh, function that takes values on uh, the, the torus. So, uh, and, uh, and you look at the distribution of, uh, of this object here that could be infinite dimensional. So suppose you, you look at, uh, um, okay, if you take multiple locations, of course, you, the more location you take, the higher dimension, uh, the higher is the dimension. And if you take a continuum uh, random field, then you could imagine of expanding this random field uh, in uh, series, Karun and Love, and look at the individual coefficients. And each one of those coefficients will uh, take uh, values in the hours of the day. So the distribution will be naturally periodic. Um, so this could be situations where you might uh, look at high dimensional densities that are live on the toes naturally. Another example could be the direction of the wind. I mean, then you have uh, the angular direction. And then again, you look at multiple locations and you look at the direction of the wind or you look at the entire random field where in each position you record the direction of the wind and you want to describe the distribution, the, the law of this process. Um, so I think high dimensional periodic densities is not so crazy. Uh, what uh, is maybe more questionable is this question of weights and this I don't have a good answer. So why do you expect weights on the density? Why do you expect smoothness of the density in first place? Is it reasonable to ask that these density functions are smooth, have a certain beta smoothness? Um, and, uh, and then the question is, what type of weights do you expect if you play with a random field of this type? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, but I would expect that uh, somehow, okay, the smoothness, uh, this depends really on the generating mechanism, whether you can show that the density, I mean, showing that the density has certain uh, smoothness might not be easy, but maybe can be worked out. Uh, show that you had uh, certain decays, I, I would expect is, it is reasonable, uh, uh, the same way it is reasonable when you expand the random fields and, uh, and you have a natural decay in the series. But again, this is, uh, this is still open uh, discussion, open questions. Uh, okay, so coming back to the, uh, the setting, the RKHS setting uh, and um, how to apply uh, the, the general analysis in this case. So we have considered this uh, core of spaces. Uh, what is nice is that, uh, again, we have an explicit uh, uh, expression for the kernel. And if beta is an integer, uh, actually, um, this uh, complicated expression becomes uh, just, uh, it can be written in terms of uh, uh, Bernoulli polynomials. So really this object is uh, easy to uh, evaluate. I mean, it's known in closed form and easy to evaluate. Uh, and uh, so th this is for the kernel uh, and then uh, for the approximating space Vn. So the points that we choose were to uh, place the kernels uh, as I have anticipated already, we uh, are using uh, rank one lattice rules. They were already introduced by Peter in the previous talk. Uh, so we use a generating vector and then we wrap it around in the, in the unit cube. Um, and uh, uh, why we chose we have chosen uh, these lattice points again because uh, I mean if you take lattice rules uh, then uh, and this type of kernels uh, actually you end up uh, as I've already anticipated with a circulant matrix so actually solving this linear system is uh, is very fast by by FFT okay um, and. Uh, so now if we want to apply the, the general result that I gave to this uh, particular setting, so we have essentially to analyze uh, uh, two terms. Uh, maybe if I go back uh, to the general, uh, so the general result is this one. Uh, so now having specified uh, the reproducing kernel uh, Hilbert space, uh, 
uh, and the choice of points, so the subspace, we have to analyze essentially this term here, which is the interpolation error in the subspace or a function f in the RKHS or the RKHS square. And uh, we have to understand the tau here that gives this extra regularity, which of course depends on the beta in the callable space. Um, okay, so for those two, for the interpolation error, uh, this is uh, actually a, a, a result. Uh, this is a recent work that uh, uh, we did with uh, Ian Sloan, Francis Ku, and um, Visa uh, Karnioja, and Yoshito um, Kazashi as well. Uh, where we have actually analyzed the kernel interpolation. So given a function G in the Korobov space, uh, H beta gamma, with certain uh, weights gamma and regularity beta, um, we were able to show that it's possible to construct a generating vector by component, uh, component by component construction uh, so that the uh, interpolation error in L2 uh, decay like n to the minus beta over two plus uh, some epsilon, let's say. Um, and of course, there are conditions on the weights to, to achieve this. Uh, the, those are uh, some summability conditions as, as were mentioned in the, in the, in the previous talk, uh, which are given here. So as long as this uh, gamma weights to this power here uh, sum up, uh, uh, then we can achieve this rate uh, uh, in uh, uh, any dimension. So the constant here is independent of the dimension. This would be an infinite dimensional first of dimension free result. Um, how good it is? Well, uh, we actually have a lower bound on the uh, interpolation error uh, n to the minus bit over two here. Um, so this is a near optimal uh, result. This is not the optimal result that you can get uh, um, with, um, let's say, um, L2 projection, but is optimal uh, uh, if you restrict to, to lattice rules and interpolation, so uh, standard information, let's say. Um, Okay, so this was for the interpolation. Now for the other part, so the tau here in the variance uh, estimate. Uh, well, uh, this um, well is relatively easy calculation. So what we could show is that uh, uh, if uh, um, given a, a certain beta, so given a certain corrobor of space H beta gamma, uh, actually uh, we can take tau um, strictly larger than one over two beta, uh, and uh, the point estimate will be continuous in this uh, H uh, beta tau space. So this is the amount by which we can, uh, the, the extra regularity that we have to, for this uh, H beta tau still to be reproducing kernel in the space. So if we put uh, this uh, together, so uh, now if we apply this for density estimation and we look at the mean integrated square error, uh, so again, I recalled here the, the general uh, uh, expression for the error. In this corrobor space context, this term here decays as n to the minus beta over two plus some epsilon. And the tau here can be taken as one over two beta plus some epsilon. Uh, and then you can balance these three error contributions you can choose n uh, and lambda so that uh, those three terms uh, decay at the same rate. And if you play this game, uh, then you end up with this uh, final estimates in terms of m only. So then the mean integrated square error for so your density approximation in L2 decays like m to the minus one over one plus one over two beta if you are in H beta gamma and one plus one over four beta if you are in H two beta, okay? So what does this, and again, this result is uh, the, all the constants are independent of the dimension here. So this is really infinite dimensional approximation of the density with a rate uh, which is worse than Monte Carlo, but this is uh, to be expected. I mean, you cannot get a better rate than one Monte Carlo if you just start with a random sample from, from the density. But this shows that you can get uh, somehow as close uh, uh, 
you can get very close to the Monte Carlo rate uh, m to, to the minus one if you have a lot of smoothness, of course. Okay, so if your density is really very, very smooth, so if beta is very large, you can get close to n to the minus one in high dimension. Um, okay, well, that's pretty much the end. I mean, we just uh, run a very, very simple example uh, where we cook it up a density, uh, in this case is even in factorized form. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we, so here, um, yeah, and then we played with uh, these uh, kernels here with variable um, smoothness alpha. Um, sorry, here I went back to the alpha notation instead of beta. <laughs> uh, and, um, and actually we do see, ah, sorry, I only put the results for D equal 15, but we have run for six and, and 15. You, have, you can look at the paper and uh, we do observe the same uh, uh, convergence rate in, in both cases. So the results are really quite independent of the, of the dimension indeed. Um, okay, that's uh, the end of my talk. So this is our, those are really uh, preliminary results and still uh, many open uh, questions on, on this density estimation, but uh, we try to analyze in the framework of reproducing kernel liberal spaces with uh, this using this um, um, and and uh, we, we so far we have looked at this uh, Korobov setting and, uh, and and lattice rules. Um, of course, uh, and um, I mean, the next steps will well on still on this periodic case it would be interesting to look at this type of applications where there are naturally periodic data and see whether one can justify uh, the smoothness assumptions or the weight uh, assumptions. But it would also be interesting to look beyond the periodic setting uh, and also uh, see whether this analysis can be extended when you enforce positivity and, uh, um, and uh, unit uh, mass condition, of course, then the problem becomes much more difficult to solve and because you have constraints, but uh, yeah, open question. Thank you for your attention. And uh, this is the uh, main paper uh, that I've presented today. The second one is the one with the interpolation result for kernel interpolation. And the third one is the one that I mentioned that where we did this regression with the penalization analysis. Thank you.